with this? How did it come across your plate? What's, what's driving accessibility at your organization? So Morgan, I'll, I'll let you start. Sure. So, you know, a few things. I think first off, we really wanted to be doing this. Um, accessibility and creating services that are uh, inclusive really cuts to the heart of what the BBC is all about. Um, we've been doing accessibility for a long time. Um, another thing is in television, there's not many options. Um, you have to be creating captions, for example. Um, and it's not just the, you know, the, the mandates and the regulations, but it's also our partners um, are insistent upon it. So, um, yeah. Okay, uh, I think for JW Player, our, per our perspective is a little bit different because we're not a content provider, we're basically a technology provider. So for us, the main driver for this is customers. Um, we have many thousands of customers who are doing just, uh, you know, I think in, in Kevin's presentation, he touched on this, just the scale of, of how much video is being created every second of the day is just gigantic. Um, so as that customer base grows and their content base grows, customers, their regulatory, not only just doing the right thing and making things accessible for, for everybody, because you know, we are a web, primarily web technology company and the philosophy of the open web is I've been involved with for a long time is it's for everybody. It should be accessible to everybody. Um, but beyond that, there are regulations. We do a lot of business in Western Europe. Now in the United States, there, there's legislation as most people in this room are probably aware. You have to be compliant uh, or you do risk getting sued or, or other um, unpleasant things might happen to you. So that there's that side of it. The other side of it is as our company have, uh, has evolved into not only the technology, but we're also now becoming a kind of data company. The video intelligence is this new um, sort of market and product that we're starting to develop where uh, the more we can know about a video and its context, recognizing what's in it, what it's about, uh, transcription, machine learning, all these things, which I'll talk about a little bit later in, in my presentation. Um, all, it's, all, it's all part of the, the same philosophy. We want to know as much about every piece of video for the customer, not for, you know, we're not doing anything creepy with this stuff or following, tracking anybody around. Uh, so those are the two pieces of it, primarily for customers, but secondarily just um, to know more about the content so that we can make for just content discovery and all these other things that, that video intelligence means to us. So. Yeah, at a Science Friday, um, we're much more than a radio show. We have videos, we have original articles, and uh, we have we provide free educational materials K through 12 um, uh, for uh, science classrooms based off our radio content. Um, so we were with NPR for a long time, um, up until about 2013, and they did, they, they do transcripts for all their shows. So when we left, we, we lost that. And um, when uh, there's a lot of staff turnover and new people coming in and uh, transcripts, we didn't have transcripts for about a year. And when that happened, uh, all these educators came out of the woodwork and we're saying we really need transcripts for our classrooms because of ADA and I, uh, IDEA. Um, uh, if you're not providing uh, different forms of, of, of learning um, for kids with disabilities or um, you know, sighted or hearing disabilities, it's, it's really crucial for teachers. So um, we, we started integrating, when, once we heard, <laughs> Because if you're if you're already doing it, it, you know it's just like a thing you should be doing, and then you don't hear people, you know, you don't expect people to say, "Hey, this is great," because it's expected. But then it goes away um, in that in that case, and then we see how great the need is for it. So, um, but yeah, we uh, we do transcripts for all our segments, for our videos, um, for our other audio products. So. Uh, yeah, but education is, is a huge component for us, and, and that's kind of the gateway for a lot of people. So let's talk about barriers for a second. In, in terms of getting things off the ground, it's more than one person, obviously. It's more than just the, this few people here sitting here. Uh, how do you get people around you to buy into this, whether it be budget, 
dev resources, you know, how do you get everyone on board to say, yeah, let's do this? I, I, again, I think for, for me, it was actually quite simple. Um, I, I, there, I've never, you know, I'm very fortunate to work in a company where this is just sort of part and parcel for what we do and what we've been doing for a long time. So honestly, there wasn't a lot of, you know, fight, if you will, um, when it came to, you know, to getting buy-in on creating uh, captions or AD or whatever it might be. Um, it's not to say that there weren't challenges, for sure. Uh, you know, cost is certainly the first thing that everyone sees and the first thing that everyone, um, you know, has a concern about. Um, but I think we, we learned very quickly, actually, that, you know, the when it comes to cost, it all sort of just comes out in the wash, if you will. You know, I think it, it made our content more valuable to our clients, to our customers. Um, and so whatever investment that we were making, um, you know, we, we easily made it back with, an, with, with, our, with our content sales. Um, so, you know, I, I don't really have any, I guess, tips. I'll, I'll leave it to, to these guys to see if they have something more useful there. <laughs> uh, well, for us, it's a matter of competitiveness, I think. As, as I mentioned, we're primarily technology provider. Um, we've always prided ourselves. You know, our core product, which is our video player, has been around now for 11 years, I think. Um, at least she would know better than me. She's the product manager. Uh, but we've always prided ourselves in being the most accessible video player. We've done, you know, we've been the first to, to integrate a lot of accessibility technologies, such as we're the first web video player to implement captions and all these other things. Um, so to maintain just competitive advantage and be, the, again, the most accessible player for everybody so that, you know, as people come up against these requirements and have to, again, with legislation and everything else, I'm proud to say I think they come to us first. And I've actually been, you know, emailing and pre preparing for this talk and things with some people and they still say you guys do this better than anybody else, be meaning primarily the, the captioning and AD and WebBTT support and things like that, so. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, it was about buy-in, right, the yeah. question? Yeah. Um, uh, it was a little bit, it was a little bit trickier for us at a Science Friday. Um, uh, you know, you really don't realize how amazing something is until you don't uh, have it anymore and you realize how much effort it takes and, and the resources required. Um, so those emails from those teachers helped a lot, but we were, it's, uh, it's, it's some, it, one part of it is just starting to do it and then like, this is a thing we're doing now and um, you know, we should ask for the, the budget for it, but also it's for people who either don't have like a personal connection to accessibility or disability, um, who are just focusing on like getting the show out every week, it can be hard to sort of like, you know, convince people that this is a thing, uh, thing we should be doing. Um, so if we have so many stakeholders with uh, our member stations, with teachers, parents, students, um, uh, everyone who listens to the show, people on the web, um, I think once you make your, you, you bring your stakeholders uh, front and center and, uh, and you can sort of uh, help people step into their shoes um, in sort of an empathy way, I think it can go a long way. Um, but then there's grant money out for this and that we're primarily grant funded uh, along with like listener contributions. Um, it, you, it does need lead up though in time so you can like, you have the time to apply for the grants. Um, but you know, it is expensive, but there are, if, you know, if you're a nonprofit like this, there are resources out there. So, so you've all mentioned basically the benefits of, of doing this stuff, which is awesome, because that's what we were always trying to preach, that there's more than just the, the cost side of this. Um, so Morgan, you mentioned ROI and, it, and the cost washing out, differentiation, John, um, you, <laughs> you realize how valuable it is once you lose it. I mean, there's some really interesting stories here. So you know, we, we talk about you know, this idea that social video has been really valuable for us because it's allowed other people to have this aha moment of, 
watching a video with captions when they had no intention of watching that video, but now they're all of a sudden watching, like, oh wow, captions are kind of cool. So, so you know, you've also all kind of alluded to mostly having full support across the organization, but what happens if you have a new producer, a new developer come in and they've never seen this stuff before? How do you get them to understand that this is a good idea and that this is what we're doing? Um, for, for the web development side of it, um, you know, uh, a lot of people, you know, or at least the people in the organization, they just interact with the way sighted and hearing people um, interact with the web, and it's hard for them to sort of understand, like, like we should have, <laughs> we need alt text on images, and it comes down to, like, getting everyone in the room and being like, this is a screen reader, and this is how, you know, this is what it, this is what it's like to experience the web in this way. And, and then when you have something that direct in front of people, I think that's like an easy way to, you know, there's so many dimensions to this and it's, and to just drop hints <laughs> every once in a while, like we have like designing, we, I, I put up these worksheets for designing for accessibility for um, autistic users or um, uh, 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 deaf users, just as d design tips, like, you know, a lot of people are audio, uh, uh, audio people at our work, but um, put it right in front of the kitchen, and it's just something that's, like, hopefully on, on people's mind, like, we're not just uh, designing this for, for people who can hear our show. Morgan, do you guys have analytics around this stuff? Are you, are you actually measuring how it's being used? Um, I don't know if we have exact numbers in that way. Um, you know, some interesting anecdotes is being a British company, a lot of, well, most of our programming is going to be with uh, British accents. So um, even, you know, even those who are not perhaps deaf or hard of hearing, uh, people really enjoy watching our programming with captions on. Um, and it's actually one of the first things I tell people when they're getting into doing captions is spend some time actually watching video with captions on. Um, you know, until you sort of immerse yourself in that experience um, and spend a lot of time, um, you know, discovering for yourself what makes a good captioning experience versus a bad or not so good captioning experience. Um, you really don't know where to start. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I don't have um, any, sort of, any sort of metrics or numbers that I can provide on the amount of people using them. I know that, um, you know, speak to our comms team, they uh, <laughs> one of the first things that you will hear um, is, is where are the captions? You know, if, if something's missing on one of our services with one of our partners, uh, captions are always the first thing that are that are noticed. Uh, if the quality is not uh, is is not as perfect as it should be, um, people will notice and and will hear about it. Um, I, I can speak a lot more into how we sort of react to those um, sorts of things. Um, so, John, it, it was differentiations I think a really interesting one. If you're already differentiated in the head. How do you continue to stay ahead in that space? Uh, well, I mean, if, to address the first question a little bit, like, a, you know, if we have a developer or a product manager comes in, and I'm, I'm actually very happy to say that the level of awareness of this stuff compared to when I started in this business in 2002 is just light years. I mean, there, so there is, there's general, you know, kind of, just people knowing the difference between a caption and a subtitle and all these things that for a long time people have just, well, we what's five the, people who cares, what's the difference? 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, right, it's like, well, caption, so everything was burned into the video. There were, you know, there was all this stuff that, um, so yeah, th th there's that. And then on the other side of it, I think, um, for us, we've always, you know, again, I, I keep coming back to, to the web standards. Like, you know, that's very, very important to us, not only philosophically, but just competitively. So we contribute to standards, we're W3C members, I encourage anybody else here to, if, if, you, if you don't have the budget to be a W3C member, you should definitely just participate. There's a lot of community groups in the W3C that don't require membership. Um, I work a lot with people from the BBC. There, there's just a lot, there's a lot of stuff going on there. So adhering to standards, contributing to standards, just being aware of what's going on in the market, what people need. I mean, uh, it, it sounds simplistic and elementary, but that's that's really what we try to do is just 
stay stay up on things. Um, there's just so many resources out there now, like the web, uh, the content accessibility guidelines. If, if people have never read that document, I encourage you to just read it. <laughs> I'll also talk about it a little bit more this afternoon. The latest version of it just was published last week. There's open source tools now that help you, you know, audit your, your website and software to make sure that you're compliant. There's just so many more resources out there uh, than there were before that we're, you know, trying to contribute to, to just stay competitive, but also because it's the right thing to do. So you're kind of all, I, I don't know, know lucky is the right word, but, you know, in a nice position to be in an organization that embraces it all. And you all, I'm sure, interact with other content technology organizations that may be trying to do something similar. What are you seeing people do wrong? What, what are you, where are you seeing the mistakes? What are, what are people missing? I think what I'm seeing um, and what we experienced a bit at first as well is we're, we're treating captions a bit like just an element in a assembly line. We're, we're sort of dehumanizing the process and not, to, and not enough people are spending enough time sort of stepping back and thinking about, again, how, how do these captions, how, how are they presented? What, um, you know, wh what is a good accessibility experience um, people are a bit more just focused on the delivery aspect, making sure they get to places on time, and that's obviously critical, uh, but not, not enough focus is, is being uh, spent thinking about the quality and the accuracy, in my opinion. Um, yeah, quality and accuracy is super important to us, too. As a science show, like, everyone's an expert in something, <laughs> and if you get something wrong, then <laughs> you will know. Um, they will let you know. <laughs> Um, but I think, I think maybe this isn't such an outward thing, but, um, as besides it just being the right thing to do, um, it can be, I think something that's overlooked is that it can be really helpful for in development content transcriptions. Um, the biggest part of our transcription budget goes towards our videos, not just for the final video product, but, um, you know, our video producer. Maybe, you know, maybe there's like two or four people in a video, and each of those people is an initial, like at least hour long interview. And having the transcripts for that immediately is, is super helpful. We use it for our social media, um, to grab things really quick. Um, one of our partners used to be PRI, and they would take our transcripts. Um, uh, on our segment pages, we usually have a few paragraphs, but they would take our transcripts for that segment someone would write, would write a whole article, and since they're our partners, we could just repost that article back on the segment page um, and, you know, hopefully hook people better that way. So there's so many, like, in-house, like, in-development advantages uh, to having transcripts besides just the last step. Uh, the first thing they do wrong is they use the wrong video player. <laughs> it should be a, uh, no, for facetiousness aside, I, I think the um, transcripts, um, uh, speech to text, most people now are pretty well clued into at least like knowing like it's something that they have to do. And I think audio description is, not, not, and that's not that something that people get wrong, they're just not doing it. And as Kevin mentioned, like, it's, you know, it's, or maybe it was in your presentation, I'm sorry, just, it's just really important to not only, uh, I have three kids on the autism spectrum, and they're very loud. So my captions are on all the time <laughs> on my television. And so, you know, there's, there's just, it's, as you mentioned, it's very helpful to just have that even as a sighted person. You know, it's just like, because I can't hear the TV half the time. It, especially the subtle sounds coming out of it. Um, so I don't th necessarily think it's wrong. It's just there, there needs to be a lot more awareness about, okay, you can't just... You know, you, yes, the, the machine um, transcription and everything is getting much better very quickly, uh, but the audio description piece of it is, as people have mentioned, is extremely expensive. It's very, very hard to do well and accurately, um, but it, it's something that people just need to be more aware of and just it, factor it in. You know, it's got it. You got to budget it. Um. So thinking about kind of now getting tactical operationally, if you. If you think about, and I'll give you options so you don't have to say anything too negative, 
but if you think about something you're either really happy you're doing today that you wish you had figured out sooner, or something you think could still be improved, like what, what, what comes to mind? What, what have you figured out well? I think something that I wish we would have done much sooner is, is figured out how to work with things like captions in-house. We were highly dependent on external vendors at first, um, and, and we still are, and I would never recommend you know, transcribing all of your content in-house. That, that's quite a lot of work, obviously. Um, but being able to do just really simple tasks with captions in-house has saved us a ton of time. It's much more efficient um, and saved us a lot in terms of operational costs. And that's just doing basic things like um, timing offsets, um, uh, making, making quick fixes. If there's a mishear or a misspell, being able to quickly open that file up, change it, get it back out to your client or partner. Um, that's, that's been a huge thing, and I wish we would have started doing that earlier. Um, on, the, on the web development side, we have these um, external sites called microsites that are just for like larger projects, which uh, we code from scratch. And um, something, I just, I wish that like in my, this isn't, I wish I'd, I had like more knowledge or I did more research on, on like all the W3 practices and, um, but I really wish my college like computer science classes like included this because there's, it's, it's not, it's, it wasn't existent in my, my computer science classes. Um, and that's where it should start um, because it's hard to hook people when they're like set, uh, they have set practices and it's so much harder. Um, and just, just learning it too, it, you know, the W3 standards are great, but it's, it's so much stuff that can be hard to know where to start and, and you know, Google Chrome has a, a pretty decent audit now, um, but it's still a, like a, a huge investment and I wish I had invested in that earlier, but you know, we're doing the best we can. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's not a lot in terms of prior education before you go out into sort of, sort of the industry and start working with this stuff. You know, people don't go to college to learn how to create captions, which, <laughs> um, you know, on my team we probably have nearly a century's worth of collective post-production experience, and not one of us actually knew a thing about SEC files, DFXP files, um, 608 versus 708. It's just not something that we learned until we had to get into it. And so, um, you know, it was very daunting at first, but how cool would it be if people, you know, especially younger people coming into the industry could have this knowledge up front instead of sort of learning it on the fly as they go? Um, I still have, I still struggle with 608 versus 708. Um, I think as a company, I wish we would have just gotten, um, so it, in 2015, uh, we, we started this kind of, Jerome and I, one of the founders of our company, said let's just transcribe everything. Every video, so, so in addition to our video player, we have a video hosting and streaming platform that does transcoding and there's a dashboard, there's all this uh, video, video tools in addition to the player that we have. Um, and that, you know, more and more customers were, were starting to, at the time they were starting to use our video platform for this hosting, all this other stuff. And we said, why don't we just transcribe every single video in there? And I'll talk a little bit about this later, but it was shocking when we got the estimate of how much, just as a rough back of the envelope. So at the time, I wish we would have taken a step back from that and said, you know what, we should just build this thing ourselves. We should make one of these and sell it and market it because I think it would have been a good business for us to be in. But at the time, we were just like, too expensive. We'll get to it later. We'll come back to it. You know, I, I wish we would have just kind of um, not paid the cost for someone else to do it, but developed a, a kind of core technology to do it ourselves. They're, those things are now, you know, coming to market, plenty of companies are doing it, but I think, I wish we would have done it a little bit ourselves. Um, another thing uh, that I've, I've talked to with our uh, education lead too is, um, you know, we're an English language so show and um, uh, Spanish language content is like the next frontier for us, we want it to be. And, you know, I think in like 2014, I think it was one in 10 uh, students in the US uh, were Spanish speakers and it's like at 2020 it's going to be something like one in four, one in three. 
um, we just started, we, we started producing um, Spanish language uh, uh, short, short videos um, that are like experiments you can do at home with your kids and um, making them ease, you know, no, no voice to just have, you know, uh, text, in that, text in there that you can easily swap out for other languages, but, um, you know, that's like an obvious limitation right now with, with our audience. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, you know, and that can go into just not only video, but like, I don't know what this could turn into, like maybe uh, having voice actors like redo our show, you know, in, in another language, um, since it's just an interview show. Um, you know, these are like things that are really far down the line, but um, just what are, what are other ways we can like get into other languages. Awesome. You wanna take some questions before we run out of time? Yeah, please. Um, we are recently one of the states that just got sued by the federal government for not having accessible websites. So we are trying to be extra accessible. And one thing we're kind of just starting is accessibility with videos. Um, so I know you said that you'd never recommend transcribing all of your content in house, um, but what are, is it, is machine transcribing actually better than humans transcribing, or do you kind of hire other humans? What is your advice? <laughs> just, uh, just to clarify on my point, um, I wouldn't recommend transcribing when you're at the scale that we are, okay. when we're, we're delivering literally thousands of hours of content per year. That becomes highly unmanageable. I, I can't speak for how much content that you'd have on your website, but um, there could be different options there for you. Um, I don't, I'll, I'll let these guys speak to sort of the, the voice recognition, the, the automation technology. We've played around with it. Where we get tripped up is the British accents. Mm. Um, <laughs> the computers just, for some reason, <laughs> really, really struggle. Especially when you have the diversity of accents that our programming does. You'll have Scottish, Welsh, Northern Ireland, all various neighborhoods and regions of London. Um, it becomes quite confusing very quickly for the computer. Uh, but I'll let these guys. Um, again, we, we need high quality, pretty fast turnaround transcripts. Um, but uh, uh, for the digital team, we have been, uh, if we need to transcribe an interview, um, or that will later become an article on our site, um, Trint is not a bad option. Um, uh, it's one of those machine uh, generated transcripts, you know, you do have to put in punctuation and who's speaking and stuff like this, but um, uh, that's a slightly more easier way to get into things. Again, at scale, it, you know, once you have something transcribed through them, um, it still requires a decent amount of time to make it look usable. Um, but it's yeah. You should it just hire Josh. Uh, use, yeah, <laughs> use case and resources available internally will really dictate what makes sense for you guys, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's getting mu better much faster, but it's still, there's the kind of uh, notion of a two-pass two -pass transcription. You, you run it through the, you know, the machine, the computer, and what you get back is, you know, mostly okay. <laughs> the accuracy rates used to be abysmal, they're getting much, much better. And then you have a human being, you know, make sure that everything is correct and, and sort of tweak it. So that, and that can really help reduce the cost tremendously. Because again, pre, you know, preface to later, uh, all the major cloud computing companies are doing this, but they're, I'd like to say that their motives are pure for accessibility, but it's not. They're all doing it for their little speakers. Um, but that has really helped this stuff get much better much quickly because they're investing millions and millions of dollars in that because they want you talking to every device in your house. There's always a middle ground too, right, where you could send it off and let the, you know, the, the automation, the computers do the work and it comes back to you and perhaps someone internally sort of fine tunes it, if you will. Um, you know, don't, uh, again, don't ever, my advice to, to folks out there doing this is to not be afraid to bring some of it 
in-house and, and to learn to do some basic things. Uh, it, it is very, very helpful to be able to just, um, you know, again, don't be overly reliant on your vendors. Your vendors are great, they're level A, but you need to be able to do some of the things yourself. Question over there. Uh, someone just spoke about Trent. Uh, my question is: these companies produce, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a transcript, but in terms of the captions which they produce, I'm not sure of the quality is that that great. Uh, because I mean, it is a cleanup required of the transcript, but even things like segmentation and all those things and. Very often we see that the output is not even there, just like chokes, you know. Companies that actually do ASR, I, I'm saying don't produce good c captions. Yeah, so that's an important point. So he's saying, just to make sure everyone understands that um, these applications of speech technology aren't quite positioned for captioning. John just alluded to that as well. Maybe, Dana, do you want to clarify the use case? Because it's yeah, a little bit different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, when I spoke of Trent, it, it's just for like, we use it, we use it purely for for in development content, it doesn't. I, don't, I might do this. I don't know. Um, but uh, we don't use it for captioning or anything, anything like that. It's it's for like the writer, um, the writer's own notes to refer to back to really easily and be able to play that part of the audio file really easily alongside the text. Um, so that can be super useful for like. So a, a good example stuff. of the use case is think of a reality television show. Uh, for that one hour show that we see there's probably 40 hours of content, maybe 50 hours of content that they have to whittle down and make interesting. Um, there's, it's pretty boring otherwise. So uh, one of the ways they do that is actually have someone, uh, like a, a production assistant essentially making notes or transcribing, um, if they're really unlucky, uh, all of that content to help the writers figure out what segments they want to, to, to have in there. So that's a, a one way to think about it. It's the same idea. Um, just kind of done a little bit differently. But in the reality TV case, um, they don't want that content going anywhere, so especially if it's a competition-based show. If that content gets out, it, the show's over. Yeah. Uh, just to follow up on the, from the woman from New Jersey, I, I, have, I work for a public school district in Connecticut, and you know, I know you guys have some skin in the game being with your services, but um, a neighboring district got cited by OCR for inaccessibility, and through their conversations with OCR, um, for videos in particular, YouTube became an, an option for them. Um, we're struggling with whether or not that's a real viable option, because again, it's a speech to text, it's maybe 80% accurate, there's plenty of errors like you showed in your opening um, with the New England Aquarium not coming out right. Um, what is your, you know, have you had conversations with OCR about where their level of tolerance is? Because um, again, you know, for a, as a public district, we have to argue for every dollar, and to you know make a, an argument one side or the other, we're going to have to have some sort of more background. So I was curious on your thoughts on the tolerability of OCR and where do you think the trends are, are heading? So yeah, I'll say something and then you guys should add. So I think they've all touched on, um, I think, really important points that there are some things you can use those tools for and then do a little bit yourself if that's you know one way to keep costs down. Um, we There is a pretty big lawsuit right now that cites YouTube captions not being good enough. That's the MIT Harvard lawsuit. Um, so they actually do cite that the YouTube captions are there, they're not acceptable. Um, so based on what we've seen, we would say don't rely on that. But YouTube also does have some do-it-yourself tools that are very good so that um, you could start with that and then if you have a couple resources in-house, help clean it up yourself to keep the cost down. Um, so that is a viable approach. Um, it's just a matter of understanding that that is necessary still. So I think we've kind of heard a little bit of that um, here as well. I don't know if anyone wants to add to it. Yeah, we've just heard from teachers that um, they're really reluctant to show videos with with uh, the YouTube generated captions, not only because of the errors, but the algorithm learns nasty words and you know puts it in front of the screen. Yeah. Well, um, John, John alluded to something very important that the engines are not, or they're not there for educational content. That's for sure. It's it's they have ulterior motives, um, and I don't think they would really hide that if you really pushed them on it. But it's very real, and it, it does affect the vocabulary. Yeah, I, I, I actually know the guy who manages all that stuff. That 
YouTube, and they are getting very, it's getting better. Uh, and he is, he does, you know, he, he's, he's deaf. He does it for accessibility. He's a great guy. He's, I tried to convince him, Ken, yeah, I tried to convince him to come, but he couldn't make it. Um, but, but um, what, we have a captions editor as well on our platform, you know, so you, again, you could just sort of run it through YouTube, don't publish it, <laughs> take their output. <laughs> you know, if, if being on YouTube is, is, is what is concerning to you, like that it's, you know, you don't manage your own ads or whatever, whatever reasons people don't want to go onto YouTube, you could use them as your transcription <laughs> service, as your first pass. Uh, upload the videos, but don't publish them. Let it generate the captions. Download those, you know, that you can export them. And I don't even know what formats there are. And then sure. tweak them, and you know, um, then put them on your own platform. Yeah. And, and the person he's referring to, the engineer at Google, who he started the auto captioning project. He's fantastic, and he will admit they're not quite there. Yeah. He, he, he know, I mean, he's deaf. He knows very well. What they what they can do, but he also the point is it's better than nothing. It's it's a start, and that's the point. Is that it should be recognized as a, as a start. I have a question, Mayor, about um, audio description. I apologize if this is redundant. I came in only at the end of the last session. I wanted to know if any of you are doing audio description at scale. I'm in a position where I'm consulting to some very very large uh, vendors to very large corporations that have hundreds thousands of videos and the cost is getting out of hand for doing it in the old-fashioned way. You have a writer who writes scripts, and if they're just for employees, we don't have broadcast standards, we can, we can edit the video to work with the description, but um, it's, it's getting unwieldy, so I was wondering if any of you have some experience of producing at scale. Well, could you clarify audio description for video? Are you referring to captions or? No, or for, for describing. Yeah. So describing what's happening on screen with the voice. Oh, yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, we're radios back in. Right. <laughs> uh, yet again, later this afternoon, just to build the suspense some more. We we are starting to explore doing this with machine learning and and uh, OC, uh, OCR meaning object and character recognition, not the thing the gentleman alluded to earlier. Uh, it's extremely difficult. I mean, we can recognize, and I'll show this later, um, you can get very basic strings, meaning text about, you know, objects and, and verbs, what's sort of going on. And there are other companies, you know, the, the big companies, Google and Amazon, they're all starting to try to do this as well. I, I don't want to be pessimistic, but it, I just, it's very, very difficult. I think that that pe the, the the transcription, like the very basic speech to text of the transcription of what's said, I'm a lot more optimistic than most people about how soon we will have 100% machine generated. I think it's within the next two years. It's just going to happen. It's getting so much better, so much faster. The description, it's very difficult to do with a machine unless you know you have just endless computing resources. Some companies do. Uh, so I wish I had a better answer for you right now. It's just very hard to do with a machine. Um, I wish. Yeah, I, if, you know, we're in the same boat. And I'd say if you, if you find out the answer, please <laughs> let us know. Um, yeah, I, do, I don't know anyone who's, who's using, you know, sort of the, 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 the automation for, for AD right now. Um, I, know, I know right now we're really just sort of trying to wrap our heads around uh, the sort of different styles that we're, we're seeing out there. Um, our parent company in the BBC Public Service has a lot of audio description and we're looking at what they're doing. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of people out in the digital space, not, actually not a lot, but those who are engaging in audio description. Um, it's very heavily scripted and it, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's very engaging. It's very much in the tone and tenor of the rest of the program. Um, and then we're seeing other uh, services where it's much more of a monotone experience. Um, and we're trying to figure out uh, for those that, you know, rely upon audio description, um, what sort of preferences that they would like to see. Um, so we're, we're not, we're still in the, very much the discovery phase. I don't have any sort of advice or tips or tricks of how you manage this at scale. I think we're all in the same boat and I think we're all tr 
trying to figure that out and seeing what sort of technology comes around the corner. Um, so, uh, so I'll say we, we launched the service a year ago, um, a little just under a year ago. And one of the reasons we actually got into it was one, certainly demand and the, the requirement for it, but uh, we actually recognized that there were no scalable solutions out there. Um, and then you wonder why. So is it because the market's not there? Well, no, the market's coming. Uh, so, so what's happening? Well, it's a lot, a lot of it's kind of like what we would say is captioning 10 years ago, which it was very expensive. People put up a big fight saying you can't make us spend all this money, otherwise we can't publish our content. So there's been that tension for a long time that it's been so expensive, and I would say in this case even more so than captioning ever was. It's so hard that it is really, it, it really is hard to bring enough efficiency to bring the cost down. And th that's our goal, that is totally what we're focused on right now and, and trying to do that. But it's hard it, and there's, a, there's only so much you can automate. Uh, and, and so what we're seeing is that a lot of networks, which is where it often starts in the broadcast world, have been very successful lobbying the government to say you can't force us to do this because it's so expensive and this will blow up budgets and, and, it, and so it, that's still there a little bit. Um, and I think a lot of companies are scared to get into it because there isn't a way to, it, it, it's hard to see how you make it more efficient. Just real quick, it, 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 there's an interesting thing with sort of entertainment content where that we're also trying to figure out which is very, very similar to, to foreign language dub, uh, dubbing where you have to have very specific voice actors, some are contracted with certain programs, some, some are always working with the exact same uh, actor, they're always the vo voice for you know, actor A. Um, but something I'd love to see more of, and I think actually AD would very much benefit from, is, is there being a push uh, to move some of the responsibility for this upstream, to move it up towards production. Uh, that's something I'm pushing for. <laughs> it's definitely very much a fight, but think about audio description. They're the ones that actually might be best served to create the best experience there. Um, that's not really a piece of advice. I don't know um, if you can apply it in your situation, um, but it's no, just another thing to consider. Yeah, and when we started, one of the things we noticed also is that in the AD space with blind, low vision users, that it w that's an area where the user experience is probably even harder to understand than captioning. I mean, captioning, you, and, and the nice thing is you write what you hear. Um, it's a little more straightforward. Whereas with audio description, there is a lot more nuance to it. Um, so the idea of the same voice actor for a certain care or for a certain type of uh, show, like Disney's famous for this. They are very, very careful about the voice actor for every single show or for, for every uh, movie. They're very, very, very careful. Uh, but then if you go out and, and, and survey users, you'll hear things like, well, I prefer synthesized voice because now I know it's not the dialogue. Well, that changes everything. So, you know, th it's, it, and you're not gonna get the same answer by any means across the board, but it, it is much, it's not as clear. Has anybody tried Mechanical Turk for this, or do you know? I don't know, okay. Amazon has this service called Mechanical Turk that basically, I don't know how they do it, but they, they pay human beings to do sort of tasks, re repetitive tasks, or, I, some people used to use them for transcription. I don't know if they've tried them for audio description yet. Um, I mean, <laughs> not good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah, we'll take sorry. one more question. Yeah. Fair enough. One more. Yeah. Question on the side here before, and we'll wrap up. It used to be that IBM dominated this technology and they were the first ones out with it. And they used the model of um, Noam Chomsky, who's the father of American um, linguistics up at MIT. And that was their model before they abandoned and they sold it off. Uh, have you ever had access to those old um, um, programs that they have? Because even Google now, they've gone back with their AI and they released Google Assist. I worked on part of that for a while and they worked on that and Google went back to Chomsky's um, gra transformational grammar, which he had abandoned when it became political. So uh, 
do you go back to see those programs? Do you know those engineers who are still alive with IEEE, who also go between Google, Apple, and the French systems? And you're, you're talking about um, OCR. That's a little easier to do than the audio and whatnot, or you're having a problem doing Spanish. But if you um, speak many languages that you're speaking in um, England, which are over there, so you have access to like a fantastic polyglot of languages. Um, um, so you have access to also Cambridge, um, Oxford, all this, and we go over to um, Polytech in France who always work together in order to compete in the European markets against the American markets. And they're also very good at language. And they have, they just also established a law. My question is kind of three tier, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, they also um, passed a law that you have to inform someone that um, they're not speaking because the technology is really good now. You have to inform someone that they're not speaking to a machine. Uh, so, do you guys want to oh, take a shot? What or question? So, um, so one, uh, do we have access to the original research, and do we go back to that? Um, is, is that fair it, for the IBM, the core research? Right, so so I can say that there's been a there's been a big push towards what's called deep neural networks, which is kind of the next version. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, the, I don't know what what model IBM. So we've tested Watson. We've tested Google services, Microsoft. We haven't tested the Amazons yet. If I think th this is your question, which, which of them is the most accurate, or? Yeah, we've found Google's. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I used to work there. there there's <laughs> plenty, plenty of resources at Google. It's, uh, but um, the Watson, you know, there, there's certain all these guys. Yeah, we we have uh, to be honest with you, Watson has not impressed us much. I, I don't know why. Google has certainly been the most accurate and fastest, and uh, you know. And again, I think to your point, because they've placed a very high priority on, um, you know, for a number of reasons, but also to compete with the other cloud services. I mean, this is a, a you know, two years ago. Wh what they de had developed previously for YouTube, you know, I talked to Ken about this two years ago or something. I said, well, when are you going to release a public API for this? And he was like, good luck, never, because we want it to be the best for YouTube. That's a whole different world now. There is a very public API in Google Cloud Platform for doing this. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I, there, I was just playing around with an app the other day on my phone that does real-time uh, transcription. I can't remember what it's called. Um, no, no, what, not a Google product. It was a startup, um, basically live transcription in real-time of a voice to text to, to chat, you know, for people to chat with each other. No, it's not a Google product. It is. Well, so I can say that a, a lot, to, to the point about Noam Chomsky, a lot of the core research and the models that are being developed are still in universities, no question. Uh, that, that you've got professors leading research on, on I mean, that's where it's all coming out of still. Now, what the cloud services are doing, they're layering on top of that and tuning it to a specific application. Uh, but the, the core research is still largely coming out of the universities. Um, so we're seeing that. But you, unfortunately, we need to, we need to. Uh, yeah, it would be nice. <laughs> Um, so I uh, want to quickly wrap up. Um, if there's anything you want to close with, with 
what piece of advice if for someone getting started? What, what, what would you say is the first thing to think about when, for someone getting started? And then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Again, I, I think, <clears throat> for me, it's, it's just spending a lot of time paying attention and watching programs with accessibility features enabled. Uh, that's, that, that's where everyone should start. You don't understand it until you actually experience it. So go out there and, and turn those features on, on on your favorite programs and um, you know define for yourself and discover for yourself what, uh, what makes a good accessibility experience. And then only from there can you actually make probably the best decision. Yeah, I would second that. Install JAWS and uh, you know, just start playing around with this stuff. Talk to people, you know, <laughs> I mean, actually, you know, surveys or, or just direct conversations um, with people about what, you know, what the best experience for them is. I, also, I would just say not to get overwhelmed because it can be very overwhelming. <laughs> uh, when you look at, you know, if you, especially a very large catalog of, of content, you're like, God, how are we ever even going to begin to tackle this? You know, it's just take it one uh, one bird at a time. Is that what the old yeah. adage is? No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, real quick, I'd say just come to events like this. You know, you're, you're off to a great start with your friends here. And just, just ask questions and you can get some better feeling. Uh, yeah, thirding all that. Um, <laughs> uh, and, you know, if you're on the side of needing to convince other people, then to start with, uh, you know, obviously cost benefit, but then the empathy side of it too. Um, it can be easy to get frustrated sometimes, but if you s try to ignore that and then just go for understanding and yeah, but obviously, yeah. Great, well, please join me thanking everyone here. Really appreciate it.